In this episode, we're continuing our discussion of the psychological model known as spiral dynamics. This is a multi-part series. This is the second part in the series. We're gonna be talking all about stage orange, which comes after stage blue. So go watch the blue episode first and then come back and watch orange, otherwise you might get lost. So the way spiral dynamics works is you have beige, purple, red, blue, orange, and then after orange you have green, yellow, and then finally turquoise. I'm not covering the lower stages because those are so basic that most people um, wouldn't get much value from that. But orange, orange is perhaps the most important stage to talk about because orange is probably the stage that you are at. I would estimate that at least 50% of my audience is at stage orange because especially in Western democracies, first world countries, and now even many third world countries, stage orange culture that has been exported from America and from the first world all around the globe now through the internet and through Hollywood movies and all of this, it all embodies the stage orange set of values and worldview. And that's fundamentally what spiral dynamic stages are. They are a system of values and a worldview that you have. And the way you got this is you were programmed and conditioned with this set of values, depending on which culture you grew up in and the era that you grew up in. The problem, of course, though, is, is that this is not just a worldview that you hold or a set of values. To you, this is reality. You hold this as the absolute truth. You hold this as being the only way it should be. And you, of course, try to impose your worldview and values onto everybody else. And it's because you're looking at the whole world from your limited worldview, you don't really understand the world. And then when you have wars and political battles and debates and religion and science and all sorts of crazy conspiracy theories and all this sort of stuff happening all around you, you don't understand how come there's all this craziness. Well, it's because you're looking at the world from your little uh, corner of the world and you don't really understand the, the greater complexity and how the mind gets programmed with this mind virus-like software, which then runs and determines how you interact with everything in life. Your color on this psychological model, like orange, for example, or blue or green, it's a set of values that basically determines how you think about every facet of life. It determines what you think a good relationship is. It determines how you think human beings should interact with one another. It determines what kind of uh, food is the right food. It determines what kind of clothing is the right clothing. It determines what kind of government is the right government. It determines how education should be, how politics should be, how business should be run. It determines your views on sexuality, on gender identity, on masculinity and femininity, on how society should be structured, on what kids should be taught in school or not taught in school, what you should believe metaphysically, whether you should believe in a God or not believe in a God or who you should pray to, what religion means for you or doesn't mean for you or your relationship to science and to rationality. All of this is dictated by the spiral dynamic stage that you are at. And this episode is gonna be highly relevant to most of you because right now, especially in first world countries and in America, most people are stuck in one of two places on the spiral dynamics model. They are between blue and orange 
and orange and green. So very few people in America and in first world democracies these days are purely solid blue. That almost cannot pass because our culture and our media is so heavily influential and it's very orange. And I'll explain what that means in a lot of detail here in a minute. So most people, even the most conservative evangelicals and the, the sort of religious nutcases in America, they are not solid blue. They are like maybe 50% blue, 50% orange, if you notice. Even the evangelicals and the Christians and the Catholics, they're still very heavily influenced by the business ideals and the sort of capitalist ideal that orange embodies. So a lot of people are stuck there. And then a little bit beyond that, the more evolved people, so to speak, they are stuck between green and orange or orange and green. So they have 50% orange in them because of the, the movies they watch and because they're interested in money and success and business and this sorts of stuff. But then also they have some higher, greener values, which is more about they care about equality and they care about compassion for other human beings and they care about the environment. So this, and so they're not fully at green. Most people are not fully at green. And so now you have this battle. That's what's taking place in American politics is this battle between half blue, half orange people and half orange, half green people. Uh, really, they're not that far apart. You could find positions along the spiral which are much further apart. And yet at the same time, it's, it feels like there's such enemies and that there's these polar opposites. It's very interesting how this works. So again, I wanna give credit to Claire Graves, Don Beck and Christopher Cohen for their research and work in developing this model. Spire Dynamics is a very complicated model. It's a very nuanced model, which required a lot of research years. These, these people dedicated their entire lives to researching this stuff. So don't think that Spiral Dynamics is just this, this simple little uh, thing for stereotyping and demonizing, caricaturizing other people. That's not what Spiral Dynamics is. It's much more nuanced than that. And also I want to give credit to the website spiraldynamicsintegral.nl. So the reason this episode is going to be so valuable for you is because you are probably uh, quite thoroughly indoctrinated into orange values and the orange worldview, so much so that what this episode is going to do, it's going to be like me pointing out water to a fish. You see, most Americans are so indoctrinated with orange, they don't know that they're in orange. They're blind to it. So it can be very helpful to start to become conscious of just the mental software that is running pretty much all your beliefs and all your behaviors in your entire life. So let's get down to it. What is the essence of orange? It's individual achievement, improving the self through artful calculation. You start to act in your own selfish interests and you're playing the game to win which is a shift away from the blue worldview. The blue worldview was about sacrificing yourself for the sake of civilization. It was about sacrificing for your country, for your religion, for your community. It was about living for the afterlife. So I'll be uh, working and disciplining myself really hard now. I'll be a good little boy in this life so that I can get to heaven to the afterlife. And then Orange says, no, wait a minute, what's more important than the afterlife is the here and now. It's the material life. We don't really care about the afterlife. Let's play this game here to improve our position. And so with orange comes the rise of business, materialism, consumerism, secular humanism, the separation of church and state, popular culture, scientism, or science as a dogma or science turned into the new religion, technology, success-oriented self-help, and the rise of democracy, as opposed to what we had in blue, which was more of a theocratic form of government. So here we have the rise of secular democracies. 
let me give you a list of all of Orange's values. This is what is nearest and dearest to Orange's heart. And these keywords, again, that I'm about to give you, these keywords are going to resonate with you if you're an orange person or if you have shades of orange. Maybe you're mostly green, but you still have bits and pieces of orange. Chances are most of you watching still have quite a bit of orange in your psyche. And these values will resonate with you. And you can use these keywords to uh, make rapport with orange people. Because as soon as they hear you using these keywords, they're going to be feeling like, oh, yeah, that's it. That's exactly what reality is about. That's exactly are my highest ideals. That's what I'm aiming for in life. That's what's driving everything I'm doing in my life, in my family life, in my business life, with my finances, with my pursuit of, of the kind of videos that I watch on YouTube. And all, the, all of this is dictated by orange values. So here they are. Perhaps first and foremost at the top of the list is achievement, success, and excellence. Orange is about climbing his or her way to the top. In orange, you have upward mobility, whereas in blue, your mobility in the social hierarchy was limited because you had caste systems and it was a very fixed, rigid system. Whereas in orange, now there's opportunities. You can work for yourself. You can become successful. You can improve yourself and you can achieve your way to the top. So upward mobility becomes possible. And as that opens up, Orange becomes obsessed with becoming number one, becoming the best, being a winner. Do you feel that in your own life? Like you're trying to be the best in your career. You're trying to be the best in your sport. You're trying to be the best in your school. That's the kind of value that Orange indoctrinates you with. Orange is about improving one position in life. Orange values efficiency, progress, productivity, and optimization. Everything must be optimized. Orange values gaming the system, min-maxing, and manipulation. Orange can be extremely manipulative, manipulating resources to uh, get the kind of successful outcomes that he or she wants from society. Creative exploitation. Orange has no qualms about exploiting a situation or exploiting a person to get the kind of outcome and results that Orange wants. Orange values action, results, and pragmatism. Orange doesn't care about the afterlife or about fluffy metaphysical philosophical ideas. Orange wants to take action. Orange wants results. Orange wants tangible goods material profit. Orange values never-ending growth. Always be growing. That's Orange's motto. Orange, of course, values capitalism and libertarianism. Orange values competitive marketplaces, deregulation, and denationalization. Why do we need regulation? We don't need that. Let's just all be libertarians. Let's just all be fighting for ourselves. It's all about individualism. Groups don't matter. Community doesn't matter. All that fluffy stuff, that maybe was something we needed back then. But these days, we don't need it. Everyone can just be fighting, gunning for himself, climbing the ladder, and uh, best man wins. Orange values hard work, business, and entrepreneurship. Orange values competition and winner-take-all situations. Orange prides himself on being a, a strong competitor. Orange values self-improvement. And here we have the rise of the self-help industry, which before was religion. Self-help was really religion, but Orange doesn't like religion. Orange wants to secularize religion, so Orange is into self-help. And so a lot of the principles from religion get sort of secularized and transmogrified into the self-help movement and self-help books, which don't make any explicit mentions of God or anything like that, or spirituality, but there's little bits in there. But mostly this sort of orange self-help is all about uh, prosperity. How do you prosper? How do you climb your way to the top? How do you manipulate better? A lot of orange self-help, and of course there's also green self-help, 
and yellow self-help, but orange self-help is all about how do you manipulate the marketplace to kind of improve your own station in life. Because of this, orange starts to value skills, knowledge, and education. The acquisition of skills becomes paramount for Orange's ability to climb his way to the top. Orange values confidence, optimism, and charisma. Orange values entertainment and showmanship. Orange values personal freedom, self-reliance, and independence. And he believes that everyone should strive towards self-reliance and independence. And dependence on the welfare state or something like that, or on the government, or dependence on religion, that this is just a crutch. Of course, Orange values free speech towards this end. Orange values money, sex, and luxury. Orange values net worth. It's all about increasing your net worth. That's how Orange judges his progress in life. Orange values physical appearance, beauty, youth, sexiness, and coolness. So with this, of course, comes consumerism and conspicuous consumption. It's all about buying the newest iPhone, buying the newest Gucci purse or the newest Ray-Ban sunglasses to look cool, to fit in with the culture, with the times. And of course, fashion is constantly changing. So it's all about having the fashionable clothes and, um, and putting up that image that sort of like you're on the cutting edge of culture. Brands is something that Orange values, whether it's Rolex or Ray-Ban or Gucci or um, Dolce & Gabbana, all this sorts of stuff, Chanel. Orange values popular culture, celebrities, and social media. All of Orange's culture is just basically a sort of glorification of celebrities because celebrities represent the orange ideal actualized. You look up to people like Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt and sexy supermodels and, and hot stars and Kim Kardashian and Paris Hilton and all this sort of stuff. And it's like, yeah, that's what I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to become famous. I'm supposed to become rich. I'm supposed to become admired. I'm supposed to become that wealthy rapper or that successful NBA player or that successful football player with the hot girlfriend and the wife and the sports car and all this sort of stuff. That becomes like, that's what life is about. That's the ideal. And celebrities, they're the ones who succeeded. So I'm going to kind of emulate and mirror the celebrities. I'm going to read what the celebrities tell me uh, works, and I'm going to do that and try to become a celebrity myself. Orange values quarterly profits, mass market, and sales. It's all about how do you increase sales? How do you take a product to the biggest market possible all around the world? Let's dumb down this product and make it as mass market as possible. Mass market books, mass market movies, mass market products, mass market food, mass market drinks, everything mass market. Orange is all about mass production and industry, which of course is the whole industrial revolution and factories and automation. Orange is, uh, orange values rationality, logic, science, secularism, and humanism. This is huge. This is one of the defining characteristics of Orange because it's a swing away from religion, belief, faith, and just uh, blind obedience to authority. So that Orange is becoming rebellious and swinging the pendulum in the opposite direction. So Orange is all about sort of thinking for yourself, uh, hard-nosed science, Orange is not interested in new age mumbo jumbo. Orange wants pragmatism, empiricism, skepticism. Orange applies skepticism to everything, except of course, to orange and to skepticism itself. And orange of course doesn't apply skepticism to science, but that's, a, that's another topic. Orange doesn't care about metaphysics. Orange feels that metaphysics is just speculative religious nonsense, which gets us into trouble and so Orange says, oh, metaphysics is just nonsense. There's nothing within metaphysics of value. What we need is we need just hard pragmatism and empiricism and utilitarianism. And of course, that ultimately lets, uh, uh, paints Orange into a corner 
because in fact, orange does have a metaphysics and orange's metaphysics is materialism, reductionism, atheism, evolution. This is orange's metaphysics, but orange doesn't see this as a metaphysics. Orange sees this as reality. It's like, Leo, that's not metaphysics. Materialism, it's just true. Science is just true. Evolution is just true. Atheism is just true. Reductionism is just true. Science has proved this long ago. Science works. Leo, look, science works. If science wasn't true, how could we have airplanes? And how could we have videos? And look, Leo, you're shooting this, this video on a camera and you're posting it on YouTube. How could any of this be possible if what you're saying about science is, 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 isn't true. How is that possible? Well, of course, um, that's, that's the myopia of orange. Orange doesn't see anything above because in orange's mind, there's only blue and orange. And so orange is reacting as blue and thinks that it's superior to blue because it's transcended, uh, blind indoctrination and dogma and, um, and sort of religious faith and authority figures. And that's good to transcend that is good, but there's uh, there's something beyond that as well. Orange does not recognize the limits of rationality or science. Orange values technology very highly. Orange values analysis. Orange values facts. And to orange, there is such a thing as facts the physical facts, these are not in dispute. To Orange, the data doesn't lie. Orange values data, analytics, models, and Orange tries to quantify everything. Everything can be fitted with an algorithm, with a math mathematical equation. Orange values science-based fact-based education. Whereas in blue, education was indoctrination, basically religious indoctrination. Orange moves away from that. And for orange now, it's about the facts. It's about teaching kids science and math and, um, and history and doing so in sort of what orange considers to be a factual and objective manner, which of course is nonsense. There's nothing factual about the way that orange teaches children, orange indoctrinates children into orange, but it's a different level of indoctrination, a different kind of indoctrination than blue. It's superior to blue, but still very limited. Orange values double blind peer reviewed studies. Orange values scientific method. The scientific method replaces the religious method that blue had a blind faith in, but of course, orange now has a blind faith in scientific method. Orange values IQ because everything can be quantified. So of course, intelligence can easily be quantified with a few tests. So let's just quantify your IQ. And of course, IQ, that's, that's going to determine how good of a rationalist you are, how good you can reason and do logic and how good of a scientist you can be. And that is the truth. So that's highly valuable in orange's opinion. Orange values strategic thinking and risk analysis. Orange values innovation and creative thinking. Orange values results and this attitude that the bottom line matters the most. It's all about the bottom line. Orange values maintaining a competitive edge. Orange values competence rather than rank or bloodlines. In red and in blue, your position within an organization often didn't have anything to do with your competence or your skills or your knowledge or whether you had a PhD or not. It had to do with what your rank was, what your caste was, and even your blood relations. Like, are you the son of the Pope? If you are, then you're going to be next in line. This sort of kind of mentality. Orange does away with that. For Orange, it's about how competent are you? How good are you at your craft? Orange values recognition and reward. Orange values win-win outcomes when orange can get it, but also orange will not have any qualms about manipulating you and stabbing you in the back to get an outcome that is just a win for himself. 
That's the values of orange. When does orange emerge along the spiral historically from an evolutionary perspective? Why does orange evolve? Orange evolves when blue starts to recognize the limitations of itself. When blue gets taken to its ultimate conclusion, blue starts to notice that, wait a minute, maybe this absolute truth that I believed in with such certainty, maybe it's not so certain. Maybe the world is not so black and white. Maybe the divisions between good and evil are not so clear. Maybe there's a little bit more gray in between. Maybe my religious authorities, maybe the Pope, maybe the Buddha, maybe Christ, maybe uh, Mohammed, maybe they didn't know everything. Maybe my Bible didn't write everything correctly. Maybe there were some things that the people who wrote the Bible didn't understand about reality. And you see, that's a big shift. Because now there's a shift away from just blind obedience to authority and religious indoctrination. And now there's a little bit more of a shift towards thinking for yourself, investigating reality empirically for oneself to verify and determine what the truth really is. And so with this historically came the scientific revolution and then a little bit later, the industrial revolution. That's how orange emerged out of blue. And as that starts to happen, science makes new discoveries which allow for new sorts of technology and this technology starts to radically transform the culture. And it starts to undermine the certainty of religion. And as that happens, the population starts to desire more of a separation between the church and the state. The limitations of fusing church and state together into a theocracy start to become very clear because then what you have is you have oppression by the religious authorities. And really you sort of have the, the, the worst of both worlds because the state government gets corrupted by religion, but also religion gets corrupted by the state. And uh, that becomes a problem. So now people want to sort of separate them out. And there's a separating out of the domains of religion and science. So science starts to say, well, we just do empirical investigation. We don't really care about cosmic metaphysical questions about God and about good and evil and about morality. Those things are not scientific. So science will just focus on, on the facts. And then if you guys want to debate about metaphysics or whatever, you can do that in your church. So, you know, there's, there's some tolerance um, uh, within Orange for religion, but mostly it's kind of cordoned off and you don't talk about religion in universities and sort of stuff. There's a sort of separation of religion from education. And of course, that's very disturbing for Blue because Blue believes it has the absolute truth, so it wants to indoctrinate the truth, whereas Orange now uh, says, no, we got to do science, we got to do studies, we got to do research this sorts of stuff. Orange becomes much more skeptical, oftentimes in a, in a neurotic and toxic manner. With uh, the transition to orange, there's an awakening to science and to rationality, which is why orange finds a lot of blue people to be irrational. You can't argue with them. You can't reason with them. You can't get them to accept the facts. You can't get a creationist to accept evolution, of course, because the creationist has not awoken to notions of rationality and scientific investigation and empiricism. Orange becomes highly pragmatic. Orange starts to desire personal success because in blue, it was about sacrificing for the afterlife. And after a certain point, you know, you sacrifice, you sacrifice, you sacrifice, but then you realize like, wait a minute, what if I only have this one life? What if there is no afterlife? Then I'm wasting my only opportunity here. And after all, how can we be sure there is an afterlife? Therefore, isn't it the most rational thing just to live this life and to get the most success and happiness and pleasure out of this life right now? And then we'll deal with the afterlife if, if it comes, but let's deal with today first. Let's fix the problems that we have as a society here today. Because look, we have dysfunctional governments, we have oppression of minorities, we have, we have technology that can help to, to 
make the entire world more prosperous. We can cure diseases and we can, we can make our lives easier. Um, but religion isn't focused on any of that. Blue doesn't care about that. Blue cares about the afterlife. And that's, that's so far uh, into the future. Who really cares about that? Orange thinks. And so Orange says, let's improve our conditions on this planet for everybody. And so Orange then becomes this pursuit, not of the religious righteous life, but the pursuit of prosperity and the idea that technology will solve all of mankind's problems. That's really the only problem mankind has, Orange thinks, is it's just that we haven't uh, built enough uh, cars and airplanes and advanced technology and computers, and we haven't interconnected the whole world with fiber optics um, to deliver entertainment and televisions to everybody and food and, and, and medicine to cure diseases. If we just had this, then the whole world would be civilized and everyone would le live in happiness. And um, that's sort of the ultimate ideal. And that's what Orange pursues. Here are some characteristics of Orange. Orange is characterized by a drive for personal results and success and status. Orange strives for autonomy and independence. It doesn't want to be hemmed in by the bureaucratic systems of blue. Blue is bureaucratic and hierarchical. And orange is all about kind of going off on your own, becoming an entrepreneur and uh, exploiting the system a little bit to get ahead. Orange seeks the good life and material abundance. Orange is characterized by having this notion that progress will come from learning nature's secrets and finding the best solutions, which we do through science. Orange is characterized by manipulating the Earth's resources. How do we manipulate the resources so that we can build the stuff we need to make life easier for everybody? If only life was easier, then all our problems would be solved and everyone would be happy. In, for Orange, societies prosper through strategy, technology, and competition. Competition is a good thing. We want people competing. Otherwise, people are just going to become lazy and no one's going to want to work. Like in a socialist country, they, Orange thinks, no one's going to work because there's no reason. There's no incentive. So we got to keep a little bit of competition. There's got to be some danger to life. You can't just give everybody a universal income and then everybody just lives happily ever after that. That doesn't work for Orange because Orange thrives on competition, thrives on outdoing other Orange people. Orange desires to enhance life through science and technology. Orange is trying to uncover the mysteries of the universe via science and mathematical algorithms. There's an aversion within Orange to religion, spirituality, and mysticism. There's a desire to secularize and demystify everything. Fundamentally, Orange believes that there's nothing mysterious about reality. Everything can be demystified as long as we just keep doing more science. The implicit metaphysics of Orange, which Orange doesn't recognize, is the Big Bang, atoms, and brains. Orange believes in an objective external reality. Reality's just there. There was the Big Bang. It came from somewhere. We got a bunch of atoms. Out of these atoms, complexity somehow evolved. And then we got these brains. And from this brain, we got consciousness. And now we're conscious of all this stuff that happened. That's Orange's basic metaphysical story. And Orange is very certain that that is all there is. That's all there is. And there's no afterlife. There's no God. There's no angels. There's no demons. There's no devils. There's none of no spirits, no ghosts, none of this airy, fairy, immaterial stuff. Reality is purely physical, purely material. Consciousness is just neurons in the brain. Psychedelics are just stuff happening in the brain. That's all it is. Religious beliefs and ideas are just mumbo jumbo, just myths. Religion is just silly superstition. All religions are false. Miracles are impossible. Healing is impossible. Paranormal phenomena are impossible. God is impossible. The devil is impossible. 
Reality is impersonal. Reality doesn't care about you. It doesn't care about happiness or love or your afterlife. None of this matters. It's just a cold, brute reality. There's really no meaning to it because it's just a physical, mechanical system. Maybe we're living in some sort of matrix-like simulation. We can't really know. We'll never know. That's an unfalsifiable proposition. That's how Orange thinks. Orange thinks that if you can't quantify a thing, it doesn't exist. Love? What is love? Love doesn't exist. Can you quantify it? No. So it doesn't exist. Intelligence. What is intelligence? Well, intelligence is what we can quantify through an IQ test. That's all it is. What about God? Well, where is God? If God existed, we could quantify it. You could point to it. But you can't point to it, so therefore it doesn't exist. That's how Orange thinks. Orange likes to point out the hypocrisy of religious blue people. Orange is quick to point out that religion has caused a lot of evil in the world, and that even though religious people claim blue people, claim to, to be moral and righteous and claim to be following the principles of God and the, the, the lofty principles of Jesus or the Buddha, in point of fact, they butcher and slaughter each other and we have the Spanish Inquisition and we have all sorts of religious fanatics and terrorists and this and that. So really, uh, the world would be much better off without religion. That's how Orange thinks. And in Orange's eyes, religion, religious people, blue people, they're just hypocrites. They're full of shit. To Orange, it's much better to just be an atheist just to admit that you don't really uh, believe in God and you don't really know what the universe holds and to just admit that you don't know and uh, to just deal with it. Orange thinks that Blue uses religion as a crutch and that what religion and thoughts of the afterlife, what that is, is that that's just Blue's inability to deal with the brute fact that you're going to die and that at the end of that there's going to be nothing another thing that characterizes orange is of course strong emphasis on logical thinking and critical observation orange is quick to po poke holes in any kind of religious theories or books orange is big on acquisition of knowledge in a material sort of fashion. Knowledge is accumulated like material, like possessions, like physical books and facts and how many theories do you know? Orange values credentials from the academic community, like PhDs and certificates and diploma. Orange values scientific expertise. Orange is focused on experience rather than dogma or metaphysical speculation. That's what universities are built upon. No one in a university is going to take you seriously if you start to talk about metaphysics or if you present dogmatic ideas. They want you to present articulated, well-reasoned arguments that are backed up by scientific data and research studies. Orange is here to play, to win, and to enjoy the competition. For Orange, self-expression comes through competition. To Orange, the world is full of opportunities. So Orange tends to be optimistic and energized to go out there and build something, to make something of himself. And because of this, Orange feels that losers, the losers in life, they deserve what they get. That bum on the street, he deserves what he gets because he's not working hard enough. If that bum bothered to go, go to the library, read some books, and pull himself up by the bootstraps and work really hard, he can clean himself up and he could scrap together some money. He could be a rags to riches story. But he doesn't want to do that because he's lazy, so he's a loser. Orange has this interesting aversion to emotions, fuzzy thinking, and to love. Orange is highly left-brained, highly logical and rational. 
And Orange believes that emotions, compassion, love, fuzzy thinking, these are all sort of woo-woo, airy-fairy, metaphysical things. These are higher order phenomena. These are not what reality is really made of. And so really your emotions are just like distorting influences on your ability to just do cold, hard, calculated reasoning. So when I'm making business decisions, I don't want emotions to come in there. I don't want my, my feelings for my employees or my, my feelings for the environment or for the animals that maybe we're going to pay over, pave over some forest um, in order to, to build our factory or something. I don't want to care about those animals. I don't want to love those animals or think about what they feel or how they suffer. That, 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 that prohibits me from optimizing my mechanical strategy for dominating the environment and for getting what I want, my success. For Orange, success is mechanical. Factories, technology, assembly lines. Accumulation, a big pile of gold. That's success to Orange. Or uh, a well-functioning business with infrastructure, factories and assembly lines and workers and, and all of this, patents, intellectual property. This is success for Orange. Orange is profit-seeking and opportunistic. Orange will try to squeeze out every last penny that it can, wherever it can, however it can, doesn't care about whether it's cheap, doesn't care whether it's cheesy or whether it's um, it's soulless. It just wants to seek the profit. Orange is all head over heart. Cold, calculating decisions. Heart is seen as weakness. That's something for girls. And of course, Orange has a problem with the feminine. Orange tends to be this sort of highly masculine approach, this sort of alpha male, alpha dominance over the world. And so you see CEOs of the biggest companies, the four, Fortune 500 companies, these CEOs, what are these? are These are like alpha males. It's all about climbing your way to the top, clawing your way to the top. You back, uh, backstab a few people here and there to get your way to, to the top. You exploit, you manipulate, you scheme, you're political to get your way to the top. And then once you're there, you're gonna be um, you're gonna be the big boss. So you gotta dress dress in a nice uh, big boss suit with the big big boss Rolex, gold Rolex on your on your wrist, and all this sort of stuff. Orange is characterized by a surging self centeredness because now it's all about myself. It's all about how do I accumulate more, increase my net worth, and maybe also look out for my family, um, but. It doesn't really matter what happens to my employees or what happens to my community. That stuff doesn't really concern Orange. Orange is characterized by image over substance. If we can fake the image of success and of happiness, then we've got happiness and success. Happiness and success is nothing but the image of happiness and success. It's a lack of substance. That's fundamentally what materialism is about. And so therefore, Orange is obsessed with physical appearance. Orange wants uh, a good physical appearance from everything around him, all the people around him. And of course, Orange wants to have a good physical appearance himself. Women are viewed as sex objects. Women are objectified. Uh, Orange doesn't really have the capacity to love or to relate to a woman. Now, of course, Orange is not just exclusive to men. Um, there are orange women as well. Um, mm, but still, it, it, it's, worse, it's worse when a man is orange than when a woman is orange. Because when a woman is orange, she still have, has her, her feminine side a lot of times, and so she still has compassion. So women actually lean a little bit more green than orange, and, and men tend to lean a little bit more orange because it's just, uh, I guess it's because of the testosterone and because of sort of the, the culture we have of being masculine and not being weak. And so for Orange, the problem is, is uh, Orange doesn't like 
looking weak or feeling vulnerable or exposing his emotions or her emotions. Um, and of course, sex is just treated sort of as a transaction. It's not really about loving the person. It's not about any kind of higher spiritual notions or connections. It's just a transaction. The more sex I can have with the more hotter people, the better. And I guess for women, the way this manifests is more like the gold digger stereotype where the woman sort of just views sex as a means toward maybe getting into a marriage and kind of locking in uh, the provider husband who's very rich and who's going to provide her with the with the nice car and the and the plastic surgery and the cosmetics and the perfume and the shopping sprees and all this sort of stuff. So definitely women can suffer from this sort of materialistic mindset as well. For Orange, there's little time or attention for people because Orange is so focused on material and Orange will use people as material. Orange tends to be cold and professional and the relationships tend to be transactional. So the reason I'm relating to another human being, if I'm Orange, is because I need something from that human being. And uh, the quicker I can get it, the sooner I can break off this relationship because once I get what I want from this transaction, it's like a business deal, then I don't need this relationship because the relationship is actually a vulnerability because the relationship puts a certain burden on me. I have to care about the emotions, navigating all this. To Orange, this is all like emotional, fluffy, girly stuff. We don't need that. Let me just get my sex, then I'm out of here. Or let me just get what I want from that person and then I'm, I'm done with him sort of thing. So orange can use and exploit people. Orange is like a shark. It thrives on activity. And sometimes it can be a little bloodthirsty. Orange can be blind to the suffering of other people. Orange can be blind to the suffering that it causes to other people in its transactional style of relating. Orange can be interested in helping other people, but often it's not in a personal way. It's in a sort of mechanical, robotical way. Like orange would like to help people in mass at a distance. So if I can build a website that helps people date or hook up, in that way I could help people as an orange entrepreneur, or as an orange entrepreneur, maybe what I do is I invent some gadget and then I try to mass produce this gadget by the trillions and spread it all across the planet and earn as much as money as possible. And yes, I'm helping people with this gadget I invented, but at a sort of at a distance, you see, I'm not really getting involved with, with people to help them. I will help them through some sort of mechanical process. And I'm not gonna focus on helping them emotionally I'm going to focus on helping them materially. So if I can invent a gadget that will help you to maybe have better sex, like I invent some sort of sex pill that increases the pleasure of your sex. Okay, great. I'll invent that. That's a, that's a tangible material thing. And then I'll sell that for lots of money and I'll make the whole world happier, this sort of thing. But, uh, but like, I'm not going to care about depression. I'm not going to care about emotional problems that people have. This stuff to orange doesn't really matter because the chief problem with mankind in Orange's eyes is that it doesn't have enough material luxury to be happy. And so that's how what we got to solve. Orange is characterized by wanting to do fun things with fun people. Orange now likes entertainment because in Blue, Blue was very uptight. Blue didn't let itself have fun or to laugh or to go to a party, to relax, to let loose. Orange now sort of takes that to the other extreme. Now it wants to go to party, wants to go drink and do drugs and have fun and listen to music and do this sort of stuff and go on vacations and eat lots of food and gorge itself. It sort of becomes a little gluttonous and hedonist. Hedonistic, rather. Orange is perfectly happy to bend the rules for personal success. Orange believes that more economic growth will solve all our problems. 
Orange tries to monetize everything. Orange comes with the rise of profanity and vulgarity. Because in blue, you could not be vulgar or profane because you had to maintain an air of religiosity. So you couldn't go around telling people to fuck off and you couldn't uh, wear shirts with, with sort of rebellious slogans on them and you couldn't be too vulgar. You couldn't say vulgar jokes in public because that would make you seem like you're not religious. Whereas orange, now the floodgates sort of open to comedy and profanity and vulgarity. And so now everyone says fuck and everyone says cunt and, and everyone's cool with it. And now it's sort of like a race to the bottom of who can say fuck mo the most. With orange comes the rise of comedy. Comedians poking fun at the status quo. See, a blue person would be scared of poking fun of religion or the church or of their society. This was all off limits. But now orange, because orange sees the hypocrisy in blue, orange goes to town. The comedians go to town, they rip apart religion, they rip apart traditional values, they rip apart the family values, all the hypocrisy of blue, they rip that all apart. They use it as father, fodder grist for the com comedic mill. Orange prefers to use intelligence rather than force. So rather than sending in the tanks, Orange will just figure out a way to manipulate the situation so that he, uh, he just buys you out. Orange takes calculated risks. Orange lo looks for loopholes in everything to see how it can exploit it. With Orange, there's a rise of the middle class, which tended to not exist in blue and in red. So this can be a very positive thing. There's also a rise of knowledge workers rather than manual laborers. Knowledge workers are much more highly valued than manual laborers. With orange, the cathedrals of blue get replaced by corporate boardrooms. I love that image, thinking of it like that. That sort of sums up orange in a nutshell relative to blue. And to orange, tradition and heritage and family values, which were so important to blue, they just become sort of irrelevant. Who cares about tradition? Who cares about heritage? Let me just forge my own path and make something of myself in, in the world. That's how orange thinks. All right, now let's cover examples of orange. I've already been giving little bits and pieces of it here, but now let's really get into this. I have a long, 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 long list of examples of orange. Now, here's what I want you to keep in mind is that I'm deliberately flooding you with examples, literally hundreds of examples here in a minute, because I want you to see the diversity of orange. There's a lot here. It's not that every single orange person fits into this narrow little straitjacket. It's a much, it's much broader than most people think. Spiral dynamics, every stage, whether it's orange or blue or green, it's not like this narrow category. It's a very broad category. And we have people who are towards the bluish end of the orange spectrum, towards the middle, or towards the extreme orange, or now towards more orange greenish. And then you have different degrees, like people who are just like super, 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 passionate about their orange and they're completely unabashed about it uh, and they just kind of completely let loose and other people who are orange but you know they kind of temper their orange they're not um like car cartoon caricatures of orange so start to notice this as i'm going to be giving you these examples so perhaps first and foremost is america as a whole i think the way that the third world or people all around the world outside of America view America is basically as epitomizing this orange set of values and ideals that we're talking about. Even though, of course, much of middle America is actually still blue, but what we export as a, as a culture through Hollywood movies and magazines and the fast food and the KFC and the McDonald's and the Walmarts and the Starbucks all over the world, what are we exporting? We're not exporting blue values and blue worldview. We're exporting 
orange Americana. And of course, capitalism. Capitalism is the epitome of orange. Capitalism taken just like full bore with no stops, that's orange. Emerging China, even though of course China has a lot of blue in it still, and technically it's communist, but the economic system of China is really um, capitalism. Businessmen, CEOs, business suits, corporate boardrooms, lawyers, Wall Street. These are all the perfect examples of orange. The movie Wolf of Wall Street, the behavior of the main character in Wolf of Wall Street, that's pure orange. That's like orange taken to its sort of ultimate extreme where orange becomes this sort of just like hedonism and just this kind of reckless pursuit of personal gain and wealth. So much wealth that you have a hard time spending it fast enough. Other examples include insider trading, the city of Manhattan, sort of is a good uh, example of orange as a whole, hedge fund managers, Goldman Sachs, big pharma, big oil, the big banks, tobacco companies, advertising, almost all advertising is an example of orange, Fortune 500 companies, entrepreneurs, libertarians, Ayn Rand, professional sports, these uh, tens of million dollar contracts that, that these celebrities and professional athletes get, FIFA, the NBA, the Super Bowl, sponsorship deals, high fashion, Rolexes and expensive watches, nightclubs, pickup. Are you into pickup? Pickup is a pure embodiment of orange. It's all about how can you manipulate girls to have uh, sex with the hottest girls as soon as possible and then move on to the next girl. That's basically what pickup is. Um, there are some people within pickup who start to lean a little bit more, more green because they start to see the limitations of, of pickup, but the essence of pickup is, is pure orange. And there's this belief that <laughs> all you really need to be happy in life is just to bang more girls. And also now you're going to say, of course, th those of you who are into pickup, and I know because I was deeply into pickup, so I'm speaking from experience here, um, you're going to say, oh, Leo, but, but it's not just about the girls. It's about growing myself and it's becoming a man. It's about weightlifting and, and eating healthy food and this is sort of RSD mentality. That's still all orange. It's still completely orange. It's still completely self-centered. It's still completely you pursuing your own achievement and your own success. Damn the consequences. Damn anything else. Mogtow, red pill. The bro culture, these are all examples of orange. Republicans, Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump and Republicans are interesting because, of course, Republicans, there's a range of Republicans. You have some Republicans that are very deeply blue, but even when they're really blue, they still have plenty of orange in them. They still tend to be business people, and they still tend to be very influenced by lobbying and this sort of stuff. Um... So most Republicans, are, I would say, are probably 50% blue, 50% orange, roughly in that area. But then, of course, you have some Republicans that lean a little bit more solid orange and less blue. And these are the people that you actually see standing up to Trump. There's a few handful of Republicans who are not accepting of Trump. Um, and, um, and then you have, um, you even have some Republicans that have a little bit of green in them. These, these tend to be the more moderate ones. So there, there's a range of Republicans and, and kind of like what they represent. But this sort of Ronald Reagan ideal of like business and deregulation and just like trickle down economics, this sort of stuff, that's what I mean is orange within the Republican Party. Uh, and of course, Trump, Trump is a great example of orange, although most people, because they haven't studied spiral dynamics really, so most people like in the news media, they assume that Trump is pure orange. And I'm not just talking about his, his skin or his, or his hair. Um, 
they assume that he's just like this typical Fortune 500 CEO type of guy. Actually, Trump is not that evolved. And towards the end of this series, which I'm going to come back, I'm going to talk about red, red, which comes before blue. You will see that actually Trump has a lot of red um, in his psyche. So the reason that Trump is not like your typical business person, he's actually much shadier than your typical kind of high functioning corporate executive is because he's got a lot of red that he hasn't uh, evolved out of yet. And so it's a mix. Trump is like a mix of pure orange and pure red. And because of this, a lot of people in the media don't really understand why Trump behaves the way he behaves because they sort of see him as a typical orange person. But then Trump, a lot of ways, behaves as a corrupt red person. And then that baffles many people because they're like, but how could he do that? Because he's at red. That's how. Other examples of uh, orange include trophy hunting, breast implants, plastic surgery, Botox, liposuction, pornography, Playboy, Hustler Magazine, Hugh Hefner, Larry Flint, strip clubs, Hollywood as a business. Now, Hollywood's a little bit nuanced because you have to separate out Hollywood as a business, which is highly, highly orange. It's all about profits versus the Hollywood celebrities who tend to be liberal green people. So when you see at the Oscars, you see these liberal elite, liberal elite celebrities and progressives who go out there and they criticize Republicans and conservatives and they, they talk about justice. These are the social justice warriors that everyone um, makes fun of, this sorts of stuff, you know. Um, yes, in that sense, those Hollywood celebrities, <clears throat> they are definitely more towards green in their political agenda, but they're very orange when it comes to their business careers and Hollywood as a whole business model is extremely orange. Hollywood really doesn't care about what it depicts on the television screen as long as it earns billions of dollars, which is why we see this sort of race down to the bottom with all these movies. It's just all about action and spectacle, and it's just all about entertainment, popcorn flicks. You just eat as much popcorn and, and soda as possible. And, and you know, this uh, movies, movies these days, they don't have much soul. They don't have much heart. They don't present you with, with sort of higher ideals, spiritual ideals. These sorts of movies, they don't make big money. What makes big money is these, these, um, these like stupid Transformers movies, these superhero movies, which are very, very shallow, very materialistic and flimsy. But they're popular, so they work. Other examples of orange supermodels, Silicon Valley, startups, venture capital, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. Now, again, these two are a little bit tricky because these days, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, now that they're old, now that they're getting close to the end of their life, they are becoming more socially conscious and actually they're moving into green and even into yellow. Like Bill Gates with his uh, foundation, Warren Buffett also is donating large chunks of money and he's speaking out about excess of capitalism, this sort of stuff, unfair tax policies, how he gets taxed less than his secretary, this sort of stuff, right? So these people, when they were younger, they were all orange acquiring billions of dollars. And now as they get older, they see that, oh, this orange stuff, it, it's not really that meaningful. And so now, of course, they're giving away lots of their money and they're, found, they're starting foundations. They're helping children in Africa with vaccines and doing science and research and all this sort of nonprofit type of work. So they are definitely moving up there. I wouldn't classify Bill Gates today as an orange person. He's probably much more green and yellow than he is orange now. But in his, in his like Microsoft days when he was doing Microsoft, um, he was probably much more orange. Other examples, casinos, theme parks, Carl Icahn, these sort of uh, Wall Street people who just want to like buy up companies, gut them, uh, like merge them, sell them, chop them up and make a killing on that. Damn the employees. The Koch brothers, damn the environment. We'll just pass regulations or government law. We'll do government lobbying to remove regulations in order to maximize our profits and 
that sort of stuff um, and to just kind of have business run unfettered. Corporate raiders, Walmart, Amazon, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Disney, Monsanto, Microsoft, GE, AT&T, IBM, Facebook, EA, Electronic Arts. All of these companies, they are uh, pure orange for the most part. Look at what Disney is doing with its monetization and kind of like buying up of all these different properties, Star Wars and Marvel and all this sort of stuff, and then just kind of like monetizing the shit out of them. Like you can find Star Wars bath salts, Star Wars soap, Star Wars tampons, Star Wars condoms. Like there's a Star Wars logo on everything because it sells. There's like no shame in what Disney will do to, to monetize its uh, intellectual properties. And of course, they are going to pay for it, which you're already seeing with the degradation of the whole Star Wars universe. Uh, this generally happens with all these companies. See, all these companies, what they do is they just take orange to their excess, to its extreme. And so what that does is basically you're going to milk the cow dry. You're going to milk the cow so much so fast that it's going to fall over dead from overmilking. That's what all these companies basically tend to do. That's the problem with uh, rampant capitalism is that it actually eats itself alive. Facebook, you see this with Facebook. And now Facebook is trying to put on this image of becoming more green. It's like, we care about your privacy and we care about this and that and we're changing up our business model. Because Mark Zuckerberg, he was a purely orange-minded uh, individual for most of his life. And now what's happening is that after he's acquired his billions and all this, um, now he's seeing that there's more to the world than billions of dollars and just increasing the number of his subscribers to Facebook. Ultimately, it's not satisfying. So where's he gonna go from here? He's gonna become more green, you see? He's gonna start to develop a little bit of a social conscious. He's gonna start to care what Facebook, how, how it's influencing the world, how it's influencing politics, you know? He doesn't like uh, the alt-right abusing Facebook or Russia abusing Facebook to, you know, to manipulate, like this sort of stuff. Um, this is not going to be satisfying to him. So he's going to be locking down those channels. But of course, he's still probably going to be very stuck in orange. And so he's going to be worried about, well, yeah, I want to, I want to make Facebook more green, but I, want, I don't want to lose all my profits and all of my subscribers. How do I reconcile that balance? Well, that's a tricky balance to, um, to figure out. So that's what he's struggling with right now. Electronic Arts is a really good example for you gamers out there. You guys like playing games. Well, video games as a whole is a perfect example of, of stage orange gamer culture. Perfect example. But see, maybe you can start to see the limits of orange when you look at what EA does with its games and with microtransactions. You see microtransactions are popping up in all these games. And of course you hate it. These loot boxes and things where they nickel and dime you for every little upgrade, every weapon, all this sorts of stuff. And it ruins all the good games that you're excited for. What is that? That's what happens when orange goes to its peak. That's unchecked capitalism for you right there. And you know, actually I was in the game industry back in 2007, 2008. And I remember the very moment I was a game designer at, um, at Irrational Games. And we were working on Bioshock Infinite. At the time, it wasn't even announced I was doing pre-production on it. And I remember uh, one of the heads of our studio walked in and, and he says, yeah, I was, I was talking to the CEO of, of um, Take-Two, which is like the parent company that owned Irrational. And he said, yeah, we need, uh, we need to put microtransactions into Bioshock. And I'm like, I'm thinking to, my, to myself, I don't say this, but to myself, I'm thinking, what the fuck? I am not putting microtransactions into my video games. Because I was sort of like a very idealistic game designer. I'm like, no, I'm not fucking putting microtransactions into my games. Um, and I actually, I, I left the studio uh, shortly thereafter because I started my own business and that was that. Um, and I sort of exited my game career. But, um, but it was very interesting. And then I didn't play games for quite a long time. Mm, and now I kind of, I, I look back at the game industry and I see how much has changed. Like it's just completely filled with microtransactions. It's just completely cheapened. Um, the artistry of games, in my opinion. And so a lot of you gamers are feeling it. So there you go. And as you feel that, you start to move a little bit more towards green because you start to see that, man, orange, 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 unfettered orange becomes uh, pretty toxic. Other examples of orange, Enron, research and development lobbyists, Dick Cheney, Halliburton, 
yuppies, the internet as a whole, bodybuilding Arnold Schwarzenegger, typifies the orange mindset, steroids, corrupt politicians, MBA programs, golf courses, fly fishing, anti-union laws, patent trolls, Western medicine, the entire Western medicine, and especially in America, the whole medical system is so corrupt with orange. It's, uh, it's quite disgusting. Larry Ellison, CEO of Oracle, is a very orange kind of guy. Steve Ballmer, oh man, Steve Ballmer is like the perfect embodiment of orange. Even his energy, his, his whole like leadership style of like energy and charisma, it's pure orange. Dave Rubin, pure orange. Stefan Molyneux, pure orange. Outsourcing, deregulation, tax cuts, trickle-down economics, payday loans, sweatshops, junk food, fast food, energy drinks, used car salesmen, marketing, sales and PR, focus groups, television as a whole, and then especially reality TV, typifies to stage orange. Infomercials, game shows, news outlets like CNN, MSNBC, the liberal media, as it's called. People like to rail, the right wing likes to rail on CNN and MSNBC as being uh, very liberal. And there's definitely news anchors on there who lean green. Um, but I mean, mostly mainstream news is pure orange. It's all about the advertising dollars. It's not about the ideological positions for them. Um, and so, if anything, the bias that mainstream news has is not against conservatism. It's against, um, well, it's towards, rather, I should say, it's towards, it's towards money. It's towards preserving the whole capitalist enterprise. It's actually against true progressivism. True progressivism can't really flourish on CNN or MSNBC because that whole enterprise is all about making advertising dollars. See? There can't really be a deep critique of the whole cable news industry because the whole thing is just uh, corrupted with money. And I don't really see how that's going to change. Other examples, e-commerce, the financial industry, software engineers, technical scientists, nuclear weapons. Luxury yachts, private jets, personal helicopters, real estate tycoons, railroads, the Gilded Age, the robber barons, Andrew Carnegie, Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, William Hurst, Rupert Murdoch, Robert Mercer, technocrats, cocaine, alcohol, pop music, rock music, club music, rap music. Some rock music is actually red, but um, that's like the very violent kind of rap music. Actually, that's probably more authentic rap music. But then you have this more shallow consumerist rap music where basically rappers are singing about getting rich and shit like that um, and how many girls they can bang. That's, uh, that's orange. The trophy wife, the gold digger, oil drilling in Alaska, champagne and caviar, fancy restaurants, luxury resorts, cruise ships, mercenaries, black water, gated communities, mansions, success magazine, private prep schools, poker players. The self-help industry. Like I said, the self-help industry has different segments in it, but mostly it starts with orange, like the Tony Robbins sort of stuff. It tends to be very materialistic. It's all about like how do you personally succeed and and get a lot of wealth. Uh, and then once you kind of evolve past that, then you move into the sort of more Oprah style, a little bit more spiritual, more woo-woo type of um, self-help, and then you move into sort of the Deepak Chopra, more stage yellow and turquoise-ish, sort of like non-dual sort of self-help, which is what Actualize.org basically is. Uh, business books, business seminars, marketing seminars, people like uh, Dan Kennedy, who's a marketing guru, and his whole marketing philosophy is just basically like, how do you market the shit out of something um, without any kind of... Uh, moral compunctions whatsoever, like manipulate and exploit anything you can to market it to its fullest. People like Tim Ferriss, Tony Robbins, Ty Lopez. Ty Lopez is a really good example of stage orange, the kind of stuff he teaches. Brian Tracy, Michael Shermer, founder of Skeptic Magazine. This guy has turned skepticism into a religious cult, and he founded a whole a magazine about it. 
I mean, he's deluded uh, to the point where it would take me a whole hour to explain all of his delusions. But this is what happens with Orange, is that you take skepticism to this sort of a uh, religious level. Richard Dawkins, another example of, of this, completely lost within uh, the limits of, of empiricism and, and rationality and, um, and evolutionary theory to the point of delusion. Uh, physicist Lawrence, Lawrence Krauss, Daniel Dennett, Sean Carroll, Stephen Hawking, Christopher Hitchens, all of these people are stuck in orange to a certain degree, mostly at the metaphysical level. They might have greenish political beliefs and so forth. I bet they, most of them do. But, uh, but as far as their metaphysics and their sort of clinging to science, that's, that's what keeps them at orange. Consulting, success coaches, the millionaire mindset, net worth, sports cars, Mercedes, BMW, Rolls Royce, Lamborghini, Ferrari, VIP, Celebrities, paparazzis, Las Vegas, the Keynes Film Festival, Aspen, Colorado, Palm Springs, Hong Kong, Macau, Dubai, cost-benefit analysis, nerd culture, polyester clothing, P.T. Barnum, snake oil salesmen, atheist skeptics, separation of church and state, enlightenment values, Western values, the founding fathers like Benjamin Franklin, Voltaire, Thomas Jefferson, the Renaissance, the Industrial Revolution, factories, Henry Ford, the World Trade Organization, the Ferengi race from Star Trek. You remember the Ferengis? They're all about money. The perfect stereotype of stage orange. Actually, you know, the Star Trek races, they were actually developed based off of the spiral dynamics model or uh, more, more accurately, the work of Claire Graves. So uh, Gene Roddenberry, who was the developer of Star Trek back in the early days in the 1960s, the, the, the very first series with, uh, with uh, Captain Kirk, he actually based the different races, like the, the Klingons, the Ferengi, and some of these others, on different stages of the Claire Graves psychological model. And so we have Ferengi is orange, the Klingons are more reddish, and then you have like the... Um, who else? Blue, blue is, the humans are kind of yellowish with their prime directive not to interfere. And you have the like, yeah, I, I forget what the, uh, what the blue one is. I'm not, a, <laughs> I, don't, I don't watch that much Star Trek. Uh, then we got Kim Kardashian, we got Kanye West, Paris Hilton, Bernie Madoff, Paul Manafort, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, that whole revolution was all about orange, sort of orange's reaction against blue. The midlife crisis, shopping malls, fashion shows, NASA, SpaceX, Elon Musk, this sort of cult worship that Elon Musk gets these days. Why is that? Why is Elon Musk so popular? It's mostly because uh, people want to glorify orange. And so they have this sort of fantasy that technology can save humanity from all of its problems. If only everybody's driving electric cars and we have a, a base on the moon and on Mars and we have SpaceX and rockets and all this sorts of stuff and we have, we're, we're drilling tunnels in the earth. <laughs> if, if Elon Musk's, all of his dreams come true, then we're going to be living in this sort of technological utopia. Now, uh, some people will object and they'll say, oh, Leo, but Elon Musk, he cares about the environment and he wants to improve mankind. So isn't that kind of green? Definitely. Certainly Elon Musk is a much more conscious CEO than probably the CEO of a tobacco company or Halliburton or something like that. Um, but still, you see, you see Musk is sort of like on this uh, boundary between green and orange, but still very, very heavily orange because sort of technology is his, um, is his, area of, of expertise. And um, there's no recognition within Elon Musk of like consciousness, the importance of consciousness, the importance of emotions, these sorts of things. Like if he really understood that, then he would actually build his, uh, his, um, his companies to reflect that. But his companies are all materialistic companies. It's about cars. It's about rockets. It's about altering the brain through like modifications through the skull. So it's all like crude materialistic sort of stuff. 
and I, I'm not criticizing him really too much or blaming him. We need all that stuff. We need better technology. We need green cars. We need better batteries. We need uh, to perhaps have a, a station on Mars just in case we, we blow ourselves up here. You know, yeah, we need that. But it's not going to solve mankind's fundamental problems. Not at all. In fact, it's going to create a whole new set of problems. Which, of course, he is sort of conscious of. You know, he's conscious of the fact that artificial intelligence could... Uh, could be a very big problem. And so that, that's good. He's looking out for us a little bit. Uh, but then, you know, uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, as they say. So we'll see what happens from all that technology. Other examples, for-profit universities, get-rich-quick schemes, online millionaires, Bitcoin, Forex, day trading, utilitarianism, logical positivism, behaviorism, Darwinism, social media, gun rights, Ivy League universities, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, MIT, Caltech, the whole military industrial complex, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, Sigmund Freud is an example of orange. Sigmund Freud's work, in a sense, is sort of was identifying all the repressed guilt and shame that came from blue and from the uh, sort of... Uh, the moralization that came from this entire era of, of religious blue society. And so Sigmund Freud was one of the first to recognize that oh, all that shame and all that guilt gets, gets buried deep in the subconscious mind. It creates all sorts of problems and neuroses. And of course, he's right about that part. But uh, he had many of his own problems. Harvey Weinstein is a perfect example of orange gone wild. The 2008 financial collapse... That's what happens when orange gets taken to its peak with deregulation. The dot-com bubble burst of the, uh, of the early 2000s. Within art, you have the cubism movement, abstract expressionism, surrealism. These typify orange values. Multi-level marketing is purely orange. Viagra, DDT, asbestos, billboards, GMOs, cloning, the human genome project, stem cell research, Robotics, computers, birth control, sex education. Orange, unlike blue, believes in science-based sex education, which pisses blue off because blue thinks sex should be repressed and hidden and shouldn't certainly be talked about with children. And you sh certainly shouldn't give condoms to children or to teenagers because that's going to encourage them to have sex. So instead, what you do is you give them virginity pledges and rings and stuff like that, which, of course, doesn't work because you can't repress sex. All-you-can-eat buffets. Karoshi. Karoshi is the Japanese word for death through overwork. <laughs> that's what happens when orange goes to its extreme. Alex Jones. Alex Jones is an interesting character because he's got, like, half-blue half orange, and then another half dose of crazy, just pure crazy. So that, that's three halves. Um, he's a big guy, so three halves to him. Um, look, with Alex Jones, yeah, he, he fights a lot for these kind of blue conservative values, but also a lot for orange sort of independent values. And of course, the way that he monetizes his entire operation and the millions of dollars that he earns every month from selling all these vitamins and all this sort of fucking nonsense... Um, it's really quite disgusting. That's what orange does. The or more orange monetizes everything. And so you get this unholy alliance between blue ideology and orange success and money. And when these things do uh, come together, like they do for a lot of TV evangelists who make lots of money doing like preaching prosperity, these prosperity preacher evangelists that you see, uh, man, it's just this, this toxic, corrosive and sort of combination of, of money and ideology that kind of like lock together and you, man, you're not going to sp split those apart. That turns into sort of a stalemate situation where that person gets, gets stuck in that because the money is so tempting for the ego on the one hand, and then the ideology is so tempting to the ego on the other hand. And when the money comes in based on you preaching your ideology, you become so convinced that the ideology is true and correct because, look, the marketplace is rewarding you for it. And so it just becomes this sort of self-justifying circle of, of nonsense. And then uh, the person sort of just kind of gets lost in it. Howard Stern. 
represents the sort of rise of vulgarity from Blue. In a sense, Howard Stern was reacting against Blue. And if you watched his movie, Private Parts, really good movie, it shows you how um, sort of how he had to deal with the whole blue radio business and he had to sort of like, like innovate. He tried to be this kind of shock jock and talk about all this vulgar stuff on the radio. But back in the, I don't know what it was, the 70s, I guess he was becoming popular in the 70s or 80s. Uh, like America was still very blue and it wasn't having any of that. So he was getting fired from different places. He was creating a lot of problems for saying vulgar words on the air. But eventually he sort of just like the culture changed so much and he was instrumental to, ha to help American culture transition from blue to orange that then it just sort of become acceptable. And now he gets paid millions, tens of millions of dollars every single year for just saying vulgar stuff all the time. And people love it. And that's the shift. And of course that pisses blue off because blue is all about decency. And they see that as a corruption of culture. House of Cards is a perfect example of this sort of Machiavellian, just like pure manipulation, exploitation, playing these political games just for one's own benefit. The movie Avatar, do you remember the main theme of Avatar? It was all about this evil corporation that was trying to mine this, this, this rare resource and it didn't give a damn what the costs were. So it destroyed all these trees and all these blue cat-like aliens and all this. So there's this epic clash between, um, between nature and man's desire to basically rape Mother Earth. And so that was, um, that was a, a really good theme that resonated with our current times. You remember the movie Boiler Room? Have you watched that one? That was a, a great movie that shows you what orange taken to its excess looks like and the problems with that. And the last example I'll give you is Sam Harris. And I left him for last because he's a complicated character and I don't have a, a time here to go into all the intricacies <laughs> of, of, of the problems with Sam Harris. Mm. But the reason I put him in the orange category, and he's not pure orange. Certainly he has a lot of green in him. He has a lot of very liberal political ideas. And he even has little shades of yellow here and there. And he does spirituality, he does the Buddhist thing. Um, yeah, he does a little bit of, of that stuff. Um, but, but fundamentally, Sam Harris's reason for existence is to promulgate this rationalist, logical, materialist paradigm, which comes sort of from his reaction against blue, uh, fundamentalist religion. That's why he has problems with Islam and Christianity and all sort of stuff. And so this is his whole, his whole shtick. Um, and the reason that Sam Harris is sort of becoming this, this cultural icon and he's becoming so popular is precisely because there are so many people who find themselves in orange and they want a way to sort of like entrench themselves in this, this, this rationalist, logical, materialist, atheistic mindset and, uh, and sort of react against blue. And blue is such an easy target for orange. You know, it's so easy to, to criticize crazy fundamentalists. It's the easiest thing in the world. Um, and so it's sort of that, that Sam Harris helps his audience to do that. That's the role he fills. And so even though Sam Harris is more evolved and more nuanced than most of his audience, most of the people who watch him and who love him and who have become Sam Harris fanatics, what they are is they're just pure orange. They're pure orange and they're sort of buy, bought into the whole orange metaphysics. So what's interesting with Harris is that his metaphysics is orange, which actually holds him back from actually becoming fully enlightened. And, um, and his, uh, but, but then he has the sort of heavily green ideals of human equality and this sorts of stuff. And the other thing with Harris is that he's a moralist. So ironically, he's a very confused figure, a very, uh, sort of complicated figure as many of us are, is that he wants to maintain the moralism of blue and at the same time, use the moralism of blue against blue. So he tries to moralize to Islam and to the Christians but he wants to moralize from a secular position, <laughs> which is just so funny. Uh, I, in the future, maybe I'll shoot a whole episode about Sam Harris and uh, Jordan Peterson because, um, you know, usually I wouldn't want to do that because I don't like to just criticize people and snipe it. I don't want to like get into the mudflinging contests that happen with these kinds of political um, 
and like pseudo intellectual debates with these sorts of people. But on the other hand, you know, these people, they spread an ideology. Sam Harris is spreading a rationalist secular ideology and it's very toxic. It might seem to orange people that actually this is good. What Sam Harris is doing is good. And it is when you compare it relative to blue. So certainly what Sam Harris is doing is, is, is far superior to, let's say, um, uh, becoming a fundamentalist Christian. But the problem is, is that it, it, then, it then gets people entrenched into orange and unable to see beyond orange, unable to really learn about spirituality and non-duality, which is uh, quite ironic because he also teaches meditation. So it's just very, this is a very complicated, messy situation with him. Uh, so maybe in the, in, the, in the future, I'll kind of pick that apart a little bit more. So what I want you to notice with all these examples is I want you to notice how much the diversity there is in orange. You don't have to check off every single box. You don't have to believe in every single value on the list of orange to be orange. Certain areas you'll be more involved in and other areas not so much. As far as orange statistics goes, about 30% of the adult global population is orange. Quite a big chunk. And perhaps even more importantly, 50% of the total world influence, cultural influence is dominated by orange. So right now, people all over the world are predominantly being indoctrinated into the orange value system through business, through science, through politics, and especially through the media and through Hollywood and through video games and through music. The government style of orange is technocratic, capitalist, oligarchic, and corporatist. And now we're going to take a quick intermission because I've been talking for a long time. I need a quick break. And when I come back, I'm going to talk about the, um, the excesses of orange and how to transcend orange, which will be very important. So stick around. All right. Let's talk about the unhealthy manifestations and excesses of orange. Remember that every stage has both its positives and its negatives and for the most part, orange is a huge step up from blue. And for most people, most of the time, orange manifests itself in a sort of healthy sense of competition, a healthy sense of entrepreneurial spirit, a healthy sense of independence and desiring to improve yourself, learn new skills, and to develop financial independence and to learn to use technology and to open your mind to science and to reason. So all of this stuff generally is healthy. And the majority of people at stage orange are reasonably well-adjusted human beings who are kind and decent most of the time. However, when you get orange without any limits, orange that just runs amok. And when you have lots of people doing orange indiscriminately, and when they create corporations and large groups and organizations, entire governments, entire systems, entire mobs of orange, then you start to run into all sorts of problems, such as environmental destruction. This is one of the most unhealthiest manifestations of orange because orange doesn't care about the environment. It doesn't care about its effect on the ecosystem. So this leads to pollution, deforestation, global warming, overfishing, endangering various kinds of species from whales to polar bears to elephants to rhinoceroses to monkeys and so on all around the world. Uh, many of the species, it's estimated that like 50% of, of the planet's species are now uh, threatened coral reefs dying, plastic waste, nuclear waste, landfills, depletion of resources like water aquifers, like they had this problem recently in South Africa where the entire, uh, entire city there, entire region there ran out of water. And so that is becoming a problem more and more around the world. And it will continue to be as populations are rising. Because see, Orange's idea is that, hey, we're just going to continue to grow our economy indefinitely, right? They need constant growth. 
But what happens when your economy starts to max out? What happens when your population reaches 10, 20 billion people on this planet and you're putting a strain on the environment? What happens then? Does the entire system come crashing down? I don't know. We'll have to see. But we're already starting to see the strains of that on our planet. And Orange is usually in denial about this because Orange just likes the sort of fantasy that we're all individuals and that we don't need to worry about ecological problems. We don't need to worry about communal problems. But of course, we do need to worry about communal problems. And that's what Orange sort of is denial in denial about. Uh, another unhealthy manifestation of Orange is this sort of secular materialist indoctrination which happens where people are programmed with scientific dogmas and they don't think critically about what science really is. And they just assume that science can be used as a cure-all solution to all problems, and they just assume that science tracks the truth. They don't question the epistemic or metaphysical foundations of science. And so what happens is the rise of scientism. Science and logic become the new religion. Orange thinks that it's so sophisticated because it's left behind the old blue religion of the prior stage, but really what's happened is that God and the Holy Bible has been replaced by scientists and PhDs and materialism and the Big Bang Theory and the Atomic Theory and that sort of thing, and logic, you see. And the deep irony is that the people like Richard Dawkins and um, like Sam Harris who rant against the evils of stage blue themselves fall into the very same trap of now becoming dogmatic about materialism and not recognizing the limits of materialism. Another unhealthy excess of orange is capitalism turned into a religious ideology. Many people treat capitalism as though it is the cure to all of mankind's problems. As though there's like two choices, either capitalism or communism. And clearly everyone knows that communism has failed and is evil, and therefore capitalism is all good. This sort of very simplistic notion of capitalism without recognizing its limits. Another unhealthy manifestation is the misuse of evidence and scientific studies. Orange is quick to use any kind of scientific study that it can to justify whatever position it basically wants. And it never really seriously investigates the deeper epistemic question of what is evidence? What qualifies as a fact? What distinguishes fact from theory? And theory from truth? These are all different things. But Orange doesn't make these subtle and uh, tricky distinctions. For orange, there are just our facts because there is an external physical reality and that's what science tracks. And human science is just a universal objective discipline and mathematics is just universal. Orange doesn't recognize that science is actually highly human biased. There's nothing universal about science at all. And mathematics is also biased to the human species. That's how the human species looks at the world. Reason and logic, these are not universal principles. This is how the human species understands the world. Orange, in its excess, is in denial about spirituality, God, consciousness, emotions, femininity, intuition, love, and magic. None of these things are real for Orange, and Orange has difficulty dealing with them or understanding other people who do? Orange is intellectually arrogant because Orange looks down at blue and sees, oh, look at those blue superstitious people. Because I am a champion of reason and of logic and of science, therefore I have transcended the whole problem of human knowledge and ignorance and delusion because I've got my scientific studies. But see, what I don't acknowledge as orange is that scientific studies really don't mean shit. You've got a new study coming out every week, every month that's telling you some other conclusion. And these science are extreme, these studies are extremely narrow. And so the question is, which 
study should you ch choose to believe? And, um, and these studies, they don't have a holistic big picture understanding of reality. All one of these studies is telling you is it's tracking one little variable within some, some little domain, which tells you nothing about how this plays into the larger picture of how to live your life and what reality is. To use evidence and studies requires actually a lot of very deep wisdom and intelligence and intuition. It's not something you can do through just a blindly st uh, uh, citing studies. Uh, the whole problem of science is that you have to very carefully differentiate between all the different interpretations of all the data. Science is not black and white in the sense that science tells you what's true or not true because every system of understanding the world and every fact is actually theory laden. Your theories and your concepts and your metaphysics and your epistemology colors what facts you get back from your experimental data and your microscopes and your telescopes. So the theories that you use to get your facts determines what facts you get back. And so it creates this sort of self-fulfilling uh, prophecy effect, which is the basically confirmation bias. But uh, Stage Orange is not aware of its own confirmation bias. So Stage Orange will be very quick to point out the confirmation biases of Stage Blue, but won't see it within himself because Stage Orange lacks a sort of metaphysical and epistemic ability to self-reflect in an unbiased way. That's because it's reacting against Blue. Stage Orange conflates Blue religion with higher post-rational levels of mysticism, like Stage Green or Stage yellow or stage turquoise mysticism. And because of this, orange just kind of lumps it all together and says, oh, it's all religion, it's all nonsense, it's all just fairy tales, which of course is not true at all. Stage orange therefore cannot understand the true origins of religion. Stage orange cannot understand why religion is so persistent and continues to exist to this day and why it plays such a big influence in politics and um, uh, human affairs all around the world, even today in the 21st century. Stage Orange just cannot fathom this, and therefore Stage Orange gets triggered and is always sort of in reaction against this, because fundamentally it's, it's, it's deluded about the origins of religion. Stage Orange doesn't see that religion actually comes from mysticism and from non-duality. Stage Orange, in its excess, cannot understand non-duality or mysticism and therefore dismisses it. And therefore, for Stage Orange, there is no possibility for a deep spiritual connection to reality. Stage Orange, therefore, cannot crack the problem of consciousness. Stage Orange cannot overcome the duality of mind and body. And Stage Orange cannot understand post-rationalism because it's lumping post-rationalism in with pre-rationalism because it's entrenched within rationalism. In its excess, stage orange can become narcissistic and self-absorbed. It can lack compassion for others. In its excess, stage orange becomes... Um, oppressive in a corporate sort of way. Corporate oppression, predatory capitalism, predatory lending, unethical business practices, high pressure sales tactics, price gouging, false advertising, the promotion of get rich quick schemes and pyramid schemes, which end up hurting lots of people and ultimately collapsing. The exploitation of third world countries by first world countries cruel working conditions and sweatshops, income inequality, gross levels of income inequality and poverty, which Stage Orange just turns a blind eye to and is in denial about. And the way that it gets away with this is Stage Orange creates this, just, this sort of libertarian justification, which says that, oh, those people who are poor or struggling 
or are victims of this uh, these cruel working conditions and sweatshops and income inequality, that actually that's their fault. It's because they're lazy. It's because they don't want to go to school. They don't want to learn. It's because they're religious. So it blames those people for these systemic problems of capitalism. Of course, with capitalism, you have the problem of oligarchy, which you see rising all around the world. And when capitalism gets out of hand, the middle class starts to shrink as the gap between the, the middle class and the lower class and the upper class, upper class starts to earn more and more of the wealth. And so there's just, just a gross, these gross income inequalities which starts to actually lead to political destabilization. And we're starting to notice that now. And it's just getting worse and worse uh, in recent decades. And we'll see where ultimately that ends. It could end in some very nasty um, political uprisings, revolutions, wars, riots, all sorts of things like that. We don't even know what the uh, what the full ramifications of that will end up being. In its excess, Orange is very legalistic. It will use lawsuits frivolously as a weapon. Wars are waged with lawsuits, with expensive lawyers patent trolling, this sort of stuff. Orange also engages in disaster capitalism. Disaster capitalism, if you haven't heard of it, uh, it's actually really worth studying. There's some great books written about this. I have a few on my book list. Um, it's quite nasty stuff. Because Stage Orange has taken on capitalism and libertarianism as this sort of new religion, it believes that every country and every situation is improved by deregulation and by freeing up the marketplace. The, f the free marketplace is supposed to solve all of life's problems and inequalities. And so what happens is when there's a disaster in some part of the country or some part of the world, then capitalists come in there and they start to deregulate everything, denationalize everything in an attempt to put in the perfect capitalist system. And then what we see actually happens is we see, um, either a collapse in that region, or we see a even more gross income inequality, or a basically you just have profiteering by these uh, shady capitalists, and that region of the world is destroyed. We've, we've seen that happen, for example, with the post-Soviet era after collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, the disaster capitalists came in there and tried to make capitalism work, but all that led to is just gross income inequality. And then what happened was that the oligarchs in Russia seized uh, the most valuable uh, and lucrative national assets all for themselves. They basically stole it for themselves, became overnight billionaires. And then the rest of the country now is, uh, is under their thumb for the last decade or two and under Putin and all of his cronies. And disaster capitalism has been tried in all sorts of other areas, like uh, after Hurricane Katrina, other places in the world, like in Iraq, it's been tried and lead, led to disastrous results. So, uh, it's quite nasty stuff. Uh, with Stage Orange, you can have unsustainable economies because it relies on never-ending growth to maintain stability. And of course, never-ending growth is a, is a pipe dream. It doesn't ultimately work. So in the short term, capitalism works, but in the long term, it's really unsustainable. So we see economic and stock market collapses, like in 2008, which can hurt lots of people and further increase income inequality. There is this uh, nasty tendency with uh, Sage Orange to privatize gains and to socialize losses, like the big banks like to do. They make very risky uh, bets with their investments and stuff, knowing that, hey, if the bank collapses, the government will just have to come and bail us out because we uh, are so important to them and because they can't uh, risk destabilizing the entire country, so they're going to bail us out. And meanwhile, we're going to line our pockets. And then who cares what happens in 10 years if the whole economy crashes in 10 years? doesn't matter to me because I've made $50 million. I'll live on that $50 million for the rest of my life. Who cares what's happening around me? That's the sort of orange Wall Street mentality. Uh, the military industrial complex can also lead to some nasty orange type of outcomes like uh, wars for resources or simply 
maintaining wars because it's good for business, it's good for manufacturing of all these military weapons. Jets, bullets, guns. Doesn't really matter who's getting killed with my weapons, my rockets, my nuclear my nuclear weapons or my bullets, as long as I can keep manufacturing bullets, I don't care. Because I'm, I'm not going to see where all this all these weapons get deployed in the third world. It doesn't matter. If I'm living in New York, it doesn't matter. It's not going to reach me. Unless, of course, you're working in, uh, in the Twin Towers, and then it does come back and it reaches you. You see? The problem with Orange is that Orange isn't systemic enough to see how the damage that it causes in the third world and all these other places, it thinks that's not going to come back and bite it in the ass, but it will. So these, these billionaires who own these coal factories and who do this environmental pollution, well, one day they might wake up and discover that their child has asthma or their child was polluted or that there's, the, the child has cancer or they have cancer, their wife has cancer or something like that because of what has been putting in the, in the food or because of the pollution in the air. And then they'll start to understand like, oh yeah, I can't just be a selfish bastard. I have to also care about the larger ecosystem. Orange can lead to the corruption of government and corporate lobbying, which we're seeing in America right now. And it's really uh, corroding our otherwise uh, relatively good democracy that we have going. It's, it's, it's really getting corroded by corporate lobbying. Orange can lead to arms races. And really, uh, the worst outcome for Orange is a worldwide nuclear Armageddon. Orange people like to complain how the greatest danger for the whole earth is getting overrun by religious theocracy, the stuff in Saudi Arabia and Iran and by terrorists. That's not the greatest danger to the world. The greatest danger to the world is stage orange. The greatest danger to the world is that stage orange will accidentally trigger a nuclear holocaust or that it will build some kind of future technology like uh, artificial intelligence, which will end up being the demise of all of mankind. But Orange, because it only seeks to maximize next quarter's profits, doesn't care about that. And so in that sense, Orange can be so short-sighted that it can basically shoot itself in the head without realizing that it's doing so, and then it's too late to fix the problem once the nuclear weapons have been launched. Stage orange in its excess can lead to animal abuse and factory farming, which can be quite disturbing and disgusting. Stage orange actually actively lobbies and passes laws. Did you know that there are actually laws in American states that forbid filming this kind of stuff that happens in factory farms because it's so disturbing that if you knew what went into making your sausages, that you love so much and your bacon and all that stuff that you would probably never purchase that stuff ever again. Stage orange leads to monopolies, which prevents small businesses from being able to flourish. Stage orange leads to deregulation, which can create all sorts of problems. Stage orange leads to shallow consumerist culture. And then from that, we have all these other social problems that arise because now when life is just about materialism and you're only living for the now and you're trying to maximize your pleasure in the moment, then what happens? You basically become a glutton and a hedonist. And there, therefore, we get problems like obesity, people eating junk food, all the health problems that come from eating this toxic fast food and all the, the junk food that you find in the supermarkets, all the corn and, and sugar and salt and, and fat and trans fat and all this sorts of stuff and chemicals in your food. This of course leads to increases in cancer, increases in ADHD, increases in autism, increases in all the diabetes and uh, heart disease problems and erectile dysfunctions and, and all of this. What do you think this is coming from? This is from orange decadence. Orange leads to sex addiction, porn addiction, shopping addiction, drug addiction, media addiction, unhealthy manifestations of orange leads to the treating of women as sexual objects, which of course 
leads to the destruction of a family unit, increased divorce rates. Excess orange leads to this sort of alpha male posturing that you see happening within the pickup communities. You see it happening within the alt-right, trolls online, this sort of alpha male mentality, alpha males trying to out-alpha other alpha males, but deep down, they're really insecure about their masculinity. So it's a sort of a fake masculinity. And deep down, a lot of these men, they have self-image problems, low self-esteem problems. So no matter how good they get at sleeping with girls or acting macho, no matter how many guns you buy or how much money you earn, fundamentally, you're still really not comfortable being a man. And you still feel like uh, there's something wrong with you. Stage orange leads to depression and lots of suicides. You've seen the suicides in the news almost every month or every year we have a new batch of celebrity suicides, whether it's Anthony Bourdain or um, some fashion designer or some celebrity or some musician, Avicii, you see this stuff. What's going on there? Because Stage Orange, recognizing no nothing else but materialism, it goes through this whole materialist rigmarole, and then eventually it gets to the end of that and it realizes that materialism is completely hollow. There's no satisfaction to be found within materialism. And so at that point, really, you've got two options. Option one is that you off yourself because that's it. You're so depressed, there's nowhere else to go. And option number two is that you find some kind of new connection to spirituality. You basically have to evolve into stage green. You have to start to reconnect with human beings. You have to reconnect with your heart, reconnect with your intuitions and emotions and your feminine side and acknowledge that there is spirituality beyond just materialism. But of course, many orange people don't know that this is even an avenue for them because they're so indoctrinated into the ideology of materialism and of, uh, of rationalism and of this sort of cold, logical approach to life. The problem is that science doesn't make you satisfied. Many of our best scientists and Nobel Prize winners and quantum physicists and logicians, they actually uh, end up in insane asylums or they end up taking antidepressants. And they're basically dissatisfied by the end of their life, even though they made all these discoveries and they think they understand the world, but really they don't understand themselves. They don't really understand reality. All they have is they have these scientific models, but these scientific models, they don't do anything for you because that's not what life is about. Stage orange leads to stuff like ulcers, heart attacks, insomnia, ADHD, all sorts of other kinds of difficult to diagnose and cure diseases like chronic fatigue disease, dozens of different kinds of autoimmune disorders. You go to the doctor, you try to get it fixed, but of course your doctor is deeply steeped in stage orange. He's a materialist and all he's basically doing is he's just peddling you pills that big pharma whole capitalist system, this corrupt uh, medical system we have, he just feeds you these pills which don't actually address any of the root issues. They just try to dumb down your symptoms a little bit and maybe they work a little bit, but fundamentally nothing really changes. And so you're walking around with all these diseases and conditions. A lot of people who end up transitioning to stage green do so literally because they get to the point where it's like a do or die choice. They're either going to have a heart attack or they have to acknowledge to themselves that stage orange is not working and they have to surrender and transcend to stage green. It's that kind of thing. They have to stop their job. They have to stop their crazy work schedule. They have to stop shoveling all this garbage junk food into their mouth because otherwise they will die. Sometimes it takes a heart attack to learn that or it takes a near suicide experience to learn that or it takes a cancer scare to really um, get you to wake up. In its excess, orange leads to unbridled ambition and competitive stress. The competition becomes too much. It becomes a stressful grind to go into work every single day worrying about competing with somebody else, worrying about some other company out competing and stealing your lunch, taking your number one spot. That, that's fun for a while, but you get, you get tired of that. And then eventually you want to cooperate more you, than you want to compete. 
Orange leads to workaholism, this whole rat race mentality of just kind of working, working, working your entire life, and then that can lead to burnout. And in the end, Orange discovers that there's no satisfaction no matter how successful he becomes. No matter how many billions you earn, no matter how many companies Elon Musk starts, no matter if he creates a colony on Mars or on Saturn or on Pluto, it doesn't matter. He's never going to be successful through that. I mean, he's never going to be satisfied through that success. See? Because Orange doesn't understand yet that there's no correlation between success and happiness. That's an illusion. That's what was motivating the rat race. But then, of course, Orange is in denial that he's in the rat race. Leo, what rat race? I'm not in the rat race. But you're there. What are you doing every day? Why are you going to work? Why are you trying to be number one? Why are you acquiring all this money and all this material stuff? Why are you buying all this stuff? Why are you buying these sports cars? It's not making you happy. Why are you having sex with all these women? It's not making you any more satisfied. In fact, the day after you have sex with the be most beautiful woman and you buy the most beautiful car and you have the most expensive house you ever wanted and you go to fine vacation, the day after that, you're going to be at the brink of suicide. That's going to be the most depressing day of your life because you've, you've gotten everything and now you discover that shit. It did almost nothing for me because what I'm really lacking is that spiritual connection, which I've been denying because I've been acting against blue. Orange leads to a sense of isolation and loneliness because Orange was always dealing with relationships in that transactional manner that I talked about. So Orange never formed any true, deep, meaningful relationships with uh, intimate partners or with friends. Because Orange never really valued relationships. Because they were kind of fuzzy and emotional and all that. Excessive Orange leads to a stifling of creativity, art, and beauty. Because of this sort of selling yourself to the devil. A lot of artists, and I think this is maybe what happened with Avicii. The reason Avicii committed suicide. I mean, I'm just speculating, but... It's certainly a very plausible theory um, because this is very common what happens with Orange is that Orange people, they get so wrapped up in the trappings of success. You become a celebrity, people start to value your work, but then all your managers and your handlers and all your corporate sponsors, they want you to keep pumping out more. It's like pumping out, pump out more and more and more, write more books, make more movies, make them even more popular, earn even more millions of dollars for us and for yourself and for everybody else. And so they kind of get you to buy into this materialistic fantasy, this rat race. But then uh, as you're doing that, of course, you have to sacrifice your own creative soul and the artistry of your work in order to go out there and to perform every single day and to mainstream your products. And then of course your audience doesn't really like the products as much as they used to. And you don't any, you, know, you no longer have a passion for developing these products because they lack that kind of soul. Really, you would have been happier as an artist to have a much smaller, more niche audience who was really passionate about your work because you were so passionate about your work rather than going so mainstream that it turns into like the next McDonald's where it's just garbage, but hey, people buy it. Orange leads to a cold technocracy where human beings are just like cogs in a machine. Orange leads to a loss of connection with nature. People live in these urban environments, these skyscrapers, these modern New York cities and, and Tokyos, but they're really, they're disconnected from the way that mankind was meant to live more in a sort of rural pastoral setting. That's why when you go out into nature and you uh, disconnect from all these concrete urban jungles, you, your whole, your whole body, your whole mind starts to think in a totally different way. Spirituality just naturally starts to rekindle with you when you are out in nature, looking at beautiful sunset, beautiful canyons, beautiful oceans and islands and this sorts of stuff. Orange, in its excess, loses sight of the human side of life. Life becomes mechanical. And that's not a fun life. You don't want a mechanical life. You want a passionate, emotional human life. 
You don't want to trade money or you don't want to trade um, emotional connection and passion for money, which is often what you have to do in order to be successful in some of these uh, high paying jobs that are available. Orange leads to a dysfunctional healthcare system like we're seeing here now in America, where lots of people die needlessly because they can't afford health care because we have this sort of uh, big pharma and um, uh, insurance industry dominated uh, health care system. And of course, Orange is in denial about all of these limitations, especially the libertarians out there and the capitalists, because, hey, it's not supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be the perfect thing. Orange is supposed to be the highest stage. Of course, there's green beyond orange, and then there's yellow beyond that, and there's turquoise beyond. There's so much more beyond orange, but orange is oblivious to all of that. Here's some common slogans that are typical of orange. Greed is good. Just do it. The sky is the limit. Win at all costs. Survival of the fittest. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Can't take care of yourself? Grow up. Stop being lazy. I made a killing in the market today. Trickle down economics. Each is responsible for him or herself. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. There is more than one way to skin a cat. We can kill two birds with one stone. Every man for himself. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That's how orange thinks. What triggers orange? In a nutshell, blue, green, and turquoise. Orange is very triggered by religion, God, creationism, myth, and superstition. Orange is very triggered by the new age. Any new age topic including spirituality, mysticism, any woo-woo, pseudoscience type of stuff. Orange is triggered by hippies. You want to trigger orange? Talk about Deepak Chopra. Nothing will trigger orange more than having Deepak Chopra talk about how quantum mechanics justifies spirituality and God. Alternative medicine triggers orange chakras and healing cancer using your mind. All of that triggers orange. Reincarnation, UFOs, intelligent design, flat earth, auras, past lives, the paranormal, cult leaders. Because orange perceives all of this stuff to just be the superstitious myth that blue is participating in. And orange has concluded that that's all false. Now, of course, what Orange doesn't understand is that it's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's not being careful enough with drawing these distinctions. And just because something sounds new agey, or just because Deepak Chopra is talking about it, just because it doesn't fit your materialist paradigm, just because it doesn't fit your current established scientific consensus doesn't mean it's not true. Because science is always lagging. Science is never at the cutting edge. There's always like a hundred year lag between what modern science has a consensus on and what is true. Today, in the 24th century, it's been a hundred years almost to the, to the year since the developments of Einstein's general relativity theory and quantum mechanics. And yet to this day, a hundred years later, most of mankind still hasn't fathomed the epistemic and metaphysical ramifications of quantum mechanics and general relativity. And in fact, Orange will go to great lengths to argue with me that, Leo, there are no such ramifications. Orange is triggered by astrology. Orange is triggered by feminism. This whole anti-feminism movement that we see these days um, uh, online, um, this sort of, uh, anti-social, social justice war, warrior stuff that you see online. This is just orange reacting against green. It's resisting moving into green. Orange is triggered by irrationality. 
Orange is triggered by intuition. Orange doesn't like intuition because Orange want every, wants everything to be quantified and laid out in a perfect logical linear sequence. And of course, intuition is non nonlinear. So that makes Orange suspicious of intuition and it makes Orange think that intuition is just like woo-woo uh, religious dogma, when in fact it's not. Intuition is a very important thing. And in fact, the most, the most genius scientists rely on intuition to make all their breakthroughs and discoveries. That's the deep irony there. Orange can be triggered by philosophy or metaphysics because Orange thinks that philosophy and metaphysics is just empty speculation and it's not empirical enough for Orange. Orange is triggered by constraints on business and entrepreneurship. Orange is triggered by having to follow rules by red tape and by bureaucracy because Orange wants everything to be hyper efficient. Orange is triggered by big government intervention and government regulations and the welfare state. Orange wants to do away with all this because Orange thinks that, hey, if everyone's just self-reliant and independent, we can all just achieve and we can all be success, uh, success stories, rag to riches stories. Of course, the fact is that the majority of people cannot do this and all of society is built like a pyramid. So society is basically a giant pyramid scheme. So what Orange is not admitting is that not everyone can be at the top of the pyramid. And so there's a necessity for the welfare state. Orange tends to be blind to its own privilege. If you grew up as a white male, for example, in a first world democracy, you are really ignorant about how easy you had it in your life. And that doesn't mean your life has been easy, but it's very hard for you to understand how difficult, just how difficult other people around the world or even within your own country have had it if they were minorities or if they uh, grew up uh, in an abusive childhood environment or if um, mm, their, their mother or their father was an alcoholic or had uh, genetic uh, predispositions to, to depression or to psychosis, to mental health issues, like all these things Orange just sort of ignores. Because in order to even become Orange and to become successful and to to compete effectively, you already have to have a lot of things going for you. Which, of course, then you tend to dismiss and you overlook and you don't, you don't see that other people don't have that. It's only when you start to notice the gross inequalities that exist, then you start to develop some compassion for other people. You start to think to yourself, man, what if I was born with a genetic defect? What if I was handicapped? What if I was a woman? What if I was black? What if I was a minority? What if I was born with low intelligence? What would I do then? Could I, could I live the orange lifestyle then? It would be pretty hard. Orange tends to get triggered by losers, bums, and freeloaders. When Orange sees a bum on the street, that can trigger Orange. Rather than triggering empathy, for Green, that would elicit empathy. For Orange, it would be uh, eliciting judgment. Orange is triggered by socialism, communism, and communal thinking. Orange does not want to think about being part of a community. Orange is triggered by touchy-feely topics like love, emotions, and intuition. Orange is triggered by the idea that the universe has human qualities. For Orange, the universe must be impersonal. There is no way that the universe can be metaphysically personal. Because it's just a bunch of atoms bouncing around in a box. Orange is triggered by identity politics and political correctness. Orange doesn't like political correctness because political correctness means that Orange has to like care about a group, has to fit into a group. Orange is too independently minded for that. Orange just cares about advancing itself. Doesn't really care about its community. Doesn't care about the impact it has on its community. Doesn't care about trying to improve its community. Those are all secondary factors for Orange. Orange is triggered by things or people who take too long to get to the point. 
Orange is triggered when there's no strategy or vision. Orange is triggered by people who have a lack of ambition to rise above average. Orange is triggered by lack of focus on results and on action. Too much talking, too much debating, too much sharing of emotions, too much relating, too much philosophy. Orange doesn't like this. Orange wants to get into action, get shit done, be pragmatic, and then go enjoy life. Orange is triggered by archaic blue societies like in the Middle East. By theocracy, by Saudi Arabia, by Iran, by communist China, these sorts of things. Orange can be triggered by hillbillies and rednecks. Now let's talk about how to transcend orange. Firstly, read in depth about the limits of orange. There are a lot of books being written these days by a lot of green authors, which talk about the limits of capitalism, talk about the limits um, and the damage that, are, that is being done to our environment and, and so on and so forth. I have a few of these books on my book list and I've already given you a lot of um, points to kind of follow up and start researching on. Also read in depth about green because green is your next stage. Green is the stage that chances are you've been resisting. It's progressivism. It's caring about other people. It's about compassion. It's about empathy. It's all the sort of bleeding heart liberal stuff that orange often has a knee jerk reaction against. So if you want to transcend orange, you have to open your mind up to green. And for you to do that, you need to stop judging green. I would say that the number one obstacle for people right now in America, especially, is that they are being fed with these orange ideologies which judge green and demonize green such that orange will never have an opportunity to evolve into green. So what you need to do is you need to stop immediately judging hippies Stop judging all new age topics. Stop judging spirituality. Stop judging religion. Stop judging feminism. Stop ju judging beta males and soy boys and all these stupid uh, derogatory monikers that you come up with in your online forums and in your on online comments. It sounds funny and cute, but ultimately you're hurting yourself because by putting on this sort of um, demonization campaign against green, you're ensuring that you will never be able to become green. You understand that whatever you demonize, you cannot then begin to embody and become. See that? Because then you would be demonizing yourself. And of course, your ego is going to have a huge problem with that. Now, of course, many people who are adamant about orange will say, Leo, I don't care about that. I don't care about stopping to demonize these people. I don't want to become a feminist. I don't want to become this beta male soy boy drinking sort of thing. Um, I don't want to become some vegan new age hippie. Well, then you're going to stay stuck at your current level of development. And you're not really going to be truly self-actualizing. If you really want to be self-actualizing, you need to go beyond green. You need to go through green and then beyond green to yellow, which is where I'm trying to take you to. But I can't take you there as long as you're demonizing green. You see? Stop judging emotionality. Stop judging compassion. Stop judging love. These are all things you're sorely lacking and you need to round you out. Rather than turning you into a beta, this is actually going to make you more of a man. Believe it or not. It's counterintuitive. Stop judging political correctness. Stop judging alternative medicine. Judgment is probably your number one trap. And I say that because that's the number one trap with all stages. Every single stage judges every single other stage. And that becomes the biggest obstacle. Because it closes your mind down to learning about the next level. Also, to help you transcend orange, ask yourself, what is the price of my success? Sure, I've been working for the last 10 years to become successful. And maybe I have become successful. But at what price? 
Start to also notice that success is not equivalent to happiness. Start to notice that every time you become more and more successful, all that happens is your mind just comes up with new goals. And so you're in this never ending rat race. And you're never going to win that race. No amount of success will ever make you happy. Notice that technology does not make you happy either. You keep getting new computers, new phones, new graphics cards. Uh, today, you have bigger hard drives, more RAM. You have uh, higher resolution displays than you've ever had in your entire life. Even in, in, just in the last 10 years, look at how much that's changed. And yet, has it made you any happier? No. Look at how video games have progressed. Video gr game graphics have increased by probably a million fold over the last 30 years. Has that made you enjoy your games more? No. That's because the mind just overlooks all that stuff. It's called hedonic adaptation. To overcome orange, start to acknowledge community. Acknowledge that you are a part of a community. Acknowledge that mankind is not a collection of individual autonomous units. This libertarian ideal is complete horseshit. Mankind is a tightly knit community. And even when you fancy yourself an individual, it's only because of the community you're in, the culture that you're a part of, the education system you're a part of, this entire spiral dynamics, uh, this entire model that you're a part of, that you're going through, that all of mankind is going through. It's only thanks to that that you have accomplished anything as an individual. You are like an ant in an ant colony thinking that it's the only ant in town, that it's the king ant, when really you're just a little worker ant. That's all you are. Even if you're the billionaire uh, of some giant corporation, all you are is still a little ant. You're part of a larger community. And how you interact and relate to and affect that community matters a lot. Start to study spirituality. Serious spirituality, not religious dogma. Stop conflating religion with spirituality. Stop being so logical and pragmatic. There's something more to life beyond pragmatism. In fact, there is no satisfaction found in pragmatism at all. Yes, you can get a lot of stuff accomplished using pragmatism, but so what? Yeah, you got a lot of stuff accomplished, but at the end of the day, you're not any happier. You're not any more passionate about your life. There's nothing pragmatic about passion. You understand this? What you want is passion, not pragmatism. You're a human being. You're not a robot. Notice the limits of science and technology. Notice that over the last 2,000 years, look at how much science has provided for us. Look at all the, the modern luxuries and material comforts we have. Hot showers and air conditioning and cars and airplanes and computers. And you've got access to porn and to movies nonstop, uh, video games. I mean, you've got everything. You've got more luxury today. The average person, even a poor person, has more luxury than the richest emperor or monarch had even 500 years ago, let alone 2,000 years ago. And yet, are you any happier? No. You're always wanting more. You're insatiable. Science and technology keeps delivering all this stuff to you, but so what? Notice that orange society is unsustainable. Acknowledge the limits of capitalism, as we've been talking about. Acknowledge the damage that business does. Acknowledge the gross inequality in the world. Acknowledge environmental destruction. Acknowledge animal cruelty and factory farming. Acknowledge that socialism isn't bad. Make a distinction between socialism and communism of the Soviet era and all the evils that came about there and recognize that that wasn't green. That was blue. I'm not telling you to go back to Soviet era communism. That's not what we're talking about. So stop conflating those two things. Find a heart centered life purpose. The way that I talk about in my course so that your life is not about earning money or just becoming successful, but it's about, it's about living your greatest passion and contributing something worthwhile and beautiful to mankind and to the world.
Stop working so much. You work too much. Start deepening your relationships. Stop treating women just as sexual objects. Start to actually care about the people you're relating to. Stop buying a bunch of stupid shit that you don't need. Stop buying sports cars and luxury watches and all this sort of stuff. You don't need it. It doesn't make you happy at all. In fact, it just makes you more stressful worrying about all this stuff and maintaining all this stuff and losing and breaking all this stuff and having to sustain all this stuff with, with working more and more and more to acquire more and more money to pay all your mortgages and all your car payments and all of this. You don't need it. Simplify your life down. Try psychedelics. At stage orange, you're ready for psychedelics. At stage blue, a stage blue person is not going to benefit from psychedelics because they're too close-minded. But a stage orange person who is ready to transition into green, psychedelics will open you up to true spirituality. It will show you the possibilities of consciousness that you never imagined were possible under the materialist paradigm. Psychedelics can break apart materialism completely for you. But you have to approach them with an open mind. Reconnect with nature and animals. Take a 10-day solo retreat in the woods where you just sit in the woods out in nature for 10 days straight doing absolutely nothing. You'll experience more growth and spiritual development in those 10 days than you probably have in the last 10 years of running around in your rat race. Read and start to do new agey type of stuff. Go to music festivals. Try alternative and holistic medicines and therapies. Start recycling. Start treating your employees like humans and not just dispensable cogs in a machine. Notice that luxury is hollow. Let go of data and analytics and trying to quantify everything. Acknowledge the limits of analysis, logic, and quantification. Notice that things within life are more than the sum of their parts and that reductionism does not account for everything in reality and start to become a holistic thinker rather than just a, a narrow-minded technical analyst. Surrender control, manipulation, and the desire to game the system and to exploit the system. Notice that exploitation doesn't actually satisfy you. Notice the disconnect within your heart from your feelings and your emotions and start to connect with that more. Cry more. Speak your heart more. Be more emotional. Embrace your feminine side. Emo uh, embrace your intuition. Start to practice compassion, empathy, and love. Cut out video games, television, and social media. And lastly, to transcend orange, the master key to transcending any stage is contemplation and self-reflection. Think about everything I talked about Think about all the stuff you've read and all the books that you should be reading and all the research that you've done. Take notes on it and then actually analyze your behavior. See how you're behaving in this orange mechanical style. Notice that orange is just a mind virus that you've been programmed with. There's nothing special about it. There's nothing important about being rational or logical or about science or any of this. You're just acting out patterns in the same way that the blue... Religious fundamentalist is just acting out patterns. So are you. The only difference is that you've been indoctrinated with a set of secular values. And you're living them out as though they're your religion, as though that's the only way to live life. And what you're discovering is that it's completely shallow and hollow. And it makes you depressed and anxious and stressful. And it gives you all sorts of bodily diseases. That's all it does. But to really understand that, you have to contemplate and self-reflect. Sit alone and think about everything. Marinate in it until it seeps in deep into your mind and you start to see the limitations. That will then start to get you moving up to green. So that's Orange in a Nutshell. Uh, a lot of details here I felt like we should really cover exhaustively because most of you are probably uh, very stuck in Orange. I know I was for a long time, and I still am to a certain degree. But man, it's really liberating to move beyond orange. It's in green and yellow where you start to experience the, uh, the, the real uh, joy and potential of life. So in conclusion, I want to warn you again to be very careful about using this model to stereotype people. 
If you're doing that, you're abusing this model. Orange, nor any other stage, is not good or bad. There are healthy and unhealthy manifestations of every stage. Do not make the mistake of starting to demonize orange in yourself or in other people. That's something I'll talk more about when we're talking about green, because green tends to have the problem of then demonizing orange. Recognize that you probably are not pure orange, but you have shades of other colors. You're probably a combination of blue, orange, and green. Maybe if you're a little bit more evolved than your combination of orange and green and, and yellow, maybe. Um... Uh, but notice that this model that we're talking about is, is a nuanced and complex model. It's not designed to put people into narrow little pigeonholes. And it shouldn't be used as a weapon against other people. You're supposed to use this model on yourself to help you to see where you need to go, what your sticking points are, where you're judging too much. And it's supposed to give you strategies for how to evolve to the next level. That can be very useful. This model can cut your learning curve uh, down by a factor of 10. So a person who doesn't know about spiral dynamics and is stuck in orange, without spiral dynamics, he would probably stay stuck in orange for the rest of his life. Maybe if he started hanging out with the right people and if he started contemplating and introspecting a little bit, he would start to recognize the limits of orange and maybe he'd start to evolve a little bit into green and maybe he'd be half orange and half green by the time of his death. With this model, that person can realize the limits of orange and see green and see beyond green into yellow and that into turquoise, see that whole thing, learn the things I'm talking about, learn how to transcend, follow this through, and then in three years he can move from orange to green and then in three more years from solid green to yellow. And then from there, in three or four or five more years, he can experience non-dual states and mystical states and uh, really crazy stuff that would just be, have been completely unimaginable to an orange person. So that's, um, that's the practical value of this model. Remember that you cannot skip over orange. So if you're heavily in blue and you're just starting to get into orange, you're gonna have to go through all of orange. You can't skip it to go to green. And that's going to be the next stage, which we're going to talk about in the next part of this series. That's it. I'm done here. Please click the like button for me and come check out actualize.org. That's my website. Check out my blog. I've been posting a lot of um, insights there, sharing a lot of videos and resources that uh, you'll probably find interesting. Check out my life purpose course that will help you to take your career, really what the Life Purpose Course will do, will take your career from orange to green and still make you very successful at the same time. So understand that to transition into green doesn't mean that you have to surrender all your money and surrender all your success. You can still have success. Green builds upon orange. Green doesn't replace orange. Every single level creates a stack, which is something that people misunderstand. So anyways, check out my life purpose course. Come sign up to the forum. We have interesting discussions there. And actually speaking of the forum, what I'm doing with this whole series is I'm creating these mega threads. We're gonna have a separate thread for stage blue, green, orange, yellow, and turquoise. And then we're gonna go back to red. We're gonna have, we're, we're making these um, giant threads of examples where we're taking prototypical examples from YouTube videos of people behaving like stage green or orange or red or whatever, and then we're posting them there so that you can go through, you can look at all these examples, you can clearly see, oh yeah, this person is just like a orange robot or a green robot or a yellow robot. And so that's um, that can be very instructive to look at those examples. That takes all this abstraction and theory and boils it down to something very concrete. So um, come check that out and come check out my book list. I recently updated the book list, so there's uh, over 200 uh, eye-opening books there. And really, the last thing I'll tell you is, if you want to learn Spiral Dynamics, it's not enough for you to just watch this six-part series 
that I'm going to release, even though it's in a lot of depth. You need to actually sit down and read some of the literature, read some of the books. And I'll be adding a few more new books that I'm currently uh, still in the process of reading. I'll be adding those soon to my list, which are going to take you even deeper into the model of spiral dynamics. There's a lot of research that went into this model. It's extremely complicated. So a lot of people who criticize spiral dynamics do so because they've just heard about it and they think it's this simplistic, stereotypical, judgmental model. That's not what it is at all. It's actually grounded in some real science, um, but you're going to have to do some reading and some serious study to start to wrap your mind around it. The beauty is, is that it's going to be highly worth it. You'll be amazed at how great this model is at helping you to understand and make sense of uh, everything that's going out around in the world. It'll sort of orient you, position you. And then, of course, always remember that this is just a model and that eventually you will have to let go of spiral dynamics. At some point, you will grow to such an advanced state of consciousness that you will see that spiral dynamics is holding you back and you will let the whole model go. That's sort of the ultimate stage that we're going to take you to, but you're probably very far away from that. So we have to build up to it with baby steps. That's why I share a lot of models and concepts with you because most people are not capable of just going from where they are now straight to enlightenment. If we could do it that way, we would do it that way. But hey, I have a difficulty doing it myself. So surely you're going to have a difficulty doing it as well. Because one of the things you learn from Spiral Dynamics is that human development comes in stages and steps. And oftentimes it takes a long time for you to get to a point where you're even receptive to reading a certain book or hearing a certain idea. A lot of energy with my work has gone into trying to undermine your epistemic and metaphysical foundations because people who are stuck in orange, which is where I know most of my audience is, they can't understand when I talk about non-duality, when I talk about God, when I talk about consciousness or intelligence, or I talk about what my highest vision is for you, where you can go, how to become a sage, how to have crazy mystical experiences, how to properly interpret and use psychedelics. None of these things are understandable given a materialist paradigm. So we have to work really hard to break that shit down, to deprogram you. And most people, they're so close-minded, they're so programmed that they don't even know that they've been programmed, so they don't even know that they need to be deprogrammed. So a lot of Actualize.org is helping you to deprogram. You might wonder, Leo, why don't you just talk about enlightenment all the time? Because most people are not ready to hear about enlightenment. And even if they hear about it, they don't understand it. They can't put it into practice. It'll take them probably five or 10 years to be able to start to put that stuff into practice. So we need to build a staircase that people can ascend. And so that's what I'm doing with Actualize.org. And it's, it's quite exhausting. It takes a lot of energy. It would have been a lot simpler for me just to talk about enlightenment all day long, like some non-duality teachers do. But the problem is that that makes your audience very small because the only people who can understand what the fuck you're talking about is the people who are already at high green or at yellow. You're not getting through to the blue and to the orange people. So uh, this was part two of the series. Make sure that you stick with me for the next part, which is going to be the green stage. Uh, that's going to be a very important stage. A lot of you are sort of borderline at that stage. And I want to talk about the limitations there and how to transcend beyond green into yellow. So stay tuned for that.